It's Clayton from Cell Dweller, and I have a very special guest in my studio today, and his name is Robert Alexander, and he is a sonification expert, and I will let, you, I will let him explain exactly what that means. Yeah, so to sonify something means that we're taking scientific data, we're turning it into sound, and we're actually listening to the data stream, and we're finding new patterns and new features. And I've worked mostly with uh, data from the sun and from outer space, which makes it uh, pretty relevant that's happening, so. And I'm amazed to find out that even our universe, uh, uh, it's musical, it's based on sound, and most people don't even think of that, and he is living proof that this does generate sound, um, and it can be tracked and it can be actually turned into music and sonified. So we're going to just talk about everything related to that and we're going to look at some of the, the, the research he's already done, some videos he's created, mm -hmm. and we're just going to geek all the way out. Oh, all the way out. <laughs> A lot of people ask me, what is data artification? Or what's a multimedia artist doing working with NASA? I was approached by the Solar and Heliospheric Research Group at the University of Michigan with a challenge. Use audio to help us learn something new about the solar wind, which is what we call the stream of highly charged particles that's constantly flowing outward from the sun. You see, there are all these satellites out there constantly gathering observations, and we have more data than we know what to do with. We traditionally analyze this information through plots and graphs, which are essentially squiggly lines that we can read to determine speed and temperature and other various parameters. It's possible to translate these squiggly lines directly into audio files and play them back over speakers or headphones. Imagine that we cut this line into a groove on a record. Through this process, 44,100 data samples get compressed into a single second of audio. When we listen closely to the frequency spectrum of the audio file, we found that sometimes we're able to hear things that were previously overlooked. In your video, you talk about how NASA was pretty excited about your findings, and then you were going through some NASA certification, or have you done that already? Or But it was yeah, like, yeah, you're, yeah. the data you're kind of just <laughs> analyzing musically, they're going, oh my god, you're discovering things that we didn't even know about our own universe. Yeah, it's been it's been absolutely wild. So I spent the, three, the last three summers working at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, awesome. um, and working with the scientists there, and when I first First drive, like I was pretty blown away. I'd like walk down the hall and I'd hear "Call Me Maybe" like playing from a room, and I was just like, "We have these spectral analysis tools right here. Like, let's put them to use." So, uh, got on the ground and started pretty quickly working with all the researchers. You know, I'm just kind of like a hacker, and I wanted to say, "Let's listen to your data and listen to your data." But a lot of the data sets, they're perfect for audification. Uh, for instance, you have this uh, satellite called the Themis satellite. It's this cluster of satellites, and they've actually been observing the Earth's uh, magnetic field and the magnetic bow shock, and so particles that interact um, you know, okay. with uh, the Earth and its upper atmosphere. So we were listening, we heard these bird chirp sounds, we heard these like clanks and whistles, and all of a sudden it sounded like you're dropping metal. When we listened closely to the frequency spectrum of the audio file, we found that sometimes we're able to hear things that were previously overlooked. Now, most solar wind turbulence sounds like wind hitting a microphone, which is not all that interesting. But sometimes the interactions between waves and particles sound like chirping birds. And occasionally we'll hear a whistling sound. Recently, we poured over millions of data points and found something fascinating. You see, the sun released an explosive cloud of particles. And when we listened closely, we heard a unique whooshing sound. In that scenario, you're hearing the universe basically bouncing off our atmosphere. And then are you trying to isolate where they originated from? Or you just type, take guesses? So, or you're just so confirming we have, the data is there? Yeah, we have a pretty good sense that uh, all of the data, it's all just coming from particles that are streaming off of the sun, okay. uh, the solar wind, right, and the Earth right. is just bathed in the solar wind. There's a lot of great imagery. And so what we're doing here is we're changing the paradigm. When you actually think about the nature of the data, when you have data that's sampled at 16K, it actually makes a lot of sense to listen to it because the ear, can pick up on a lot of really subtle things in the frequency spectrum, like if you're sitting at a cocktail party, you know, it's to walk up to you and we're smoozing or something, mm -hmm. and there's stuff happening in the background, and there's plates clanking in the other room, and there's someone else talking over here and over there. We can hone in on each other's voices, and that's yes. known as the cocktail party effect, and that's a scientific mm -hmm. phenomena where our ears are really good at picking up patterns from complex signals. Mm-hmm. And these, this, these are just faders. That's literally right. all they are. Beautiful ambience. 
dry. That's all it is. And then there's my filter. Mm. But you throw some reverb on that. See, that adds the, the wetness, the warmth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Brings it what together. you might call the, the fatness. Technical it's the term. analog, it's an analog, and that's the thing, I'm a digital guy, you know, like I've done, I've done a lot of albums primarily in the box, with the exception of live instrumentation, so I play drums, guitar, bass, whatever, mm -hmm. but apart from all that, mm -hmm. everything else is pretty much done in the box, editing, mm -hmm. it's all the synth work, and once I discovered this and I was like, man, I mean I've had Moog Voyager, I have some analog synths, but the, this stuff and it's like the sound quality, I was like, man, it's like once I heard it, I'm like, I can't, it's hard for me to go back to a digital synth. <laughs> Right now I have nothing closing, I have nothing closing the, the, there's no, nothing closing the amplitude, so it's just pretty much constantly running. Yeah, but yeah, if you I'll touch that, there. and then I have an attenuator on it right now, so I don't even have it, that's at 100%, so that'll be, that'll be very sensitive. So I can attenuate that signal, yeah. so that I can okay, have so more control, so amplitude. you can touch it, I mean it's, right now there's not a huge musical application, but you can, understand? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. And I like to think that individuals like you and I, where we take this technology and then we use it for purposes of creative expression, like, you know, we're working for the side of good, right. where, you know, <laughs> who else knows what else is going on with all this technology, but to actually, like, you know, to take it and to just explore it means to be human, to express ourselves. Yeah. Like, oh, that's the greatest possible it, it is, it is. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I have made music just purely because that's what's in me to do, is to make music, but... Being able to infuse what I'm actually interested in into my music, both lyrically, visually, and everything else, that's when things really started making sense to me and started clicking. Yeah, if you look at the movie Interstellar, where the actual research that went into visualizing the black hole then advanced science in our understanding of right. you know, the way in which visible light would wrap around the event horizon, you know, that's another instance of you know, art then pushing science, and then you know science advances art in my case, and so... Yeah, but in my mind, the two go hand back and in forth, hand. right? And it just like yeah. keeps keeps kind of growing, which is which is Absolutely. great. You know, it's like I am a uh, you know not to sound like a geek, but I'm a big Neil deGrasse Tyson fan. I'm a, I watch Star Talk, and Neil, this is directly to you. If you want me to rewrite that Star Talk opening theme, I will gladly do it for free. Please let me do it. <laughs> um, but but you know he's out there and he he brings artists in all the time to talk about how artists are refusing, but but never once talks about music. And it's like I'm like oh man, put me in, coach. Let me let me talk about yeah. it because. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just, I mean, it just blows my mind. You know, even even just seeing, fr from my perspective, seeing like coronal mass ejections, let's say, some huge eruption from the sun, and we're looking mm -hmm. at it on our little screens or our phones, we're like, oh, that's cute. Right. And it's like, that thing is like <laughs> 10 or 100 yeah. times the size of the Earth. Right. Like, you don't even realize how big that is. <laughs> to put that into to put context. That in con right, you can yeah, yeah, tell yeah. me how big is a, like a coronal mass ejection, let's say, like a, like, Oh my god, yeah, a tremendous, uh, just an absolutely tremendous eruption of material that happens in those instances. And when I arrived and was working with the solar research group, I really didn't understand like the magnitude of what was taking place until they started to pull up a lot of these videos and kind of show me like and put that into perspective for me. And then it was actually then sonifying the data and hearing that like some of them had this roar quality and actually like putting that presence into the room. Like that changes the nature of It the makes data you realize, itself. oh wow, this is yeah. this is huge. That I, like when you hear it coming through the subwoofer and it like shakes the foundation of the room <laughs> that you're in, you're like, all right, that's a little bit closer to the actual way in which we should experience it. The experience Right, this data. right. You, you have a musical background, so you, you. How exciting was it for you when you started realizing, like, holy crap, I can actually make data from the solar system <laughs> musical. Like, I can like actually. Like it yeah, sounded yeah. like in your video, the one that I watched on YouTube, mm -hmm. you basically were like, it was almost like you just did it, and then people were, were, were going, oh, we didn't even. And then people, when they realized what you were doing, like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, we need to do more of this. Yeah. It so, wasn't like you went in going like, okay, I'm going to do this and this is going to be the end result. You just kind of just started going, I'm interested in this, do it. Oh, it was extremely exploratory. And that's part of why I loved about it. And the research group, they really just jumped on board. In our early meetings, they were great because they were saying like, oh, I think that you know, maybe each solar rotation, that's a hit of a drum. Or I think that you know maybe mm. this would be represented by voices. And everyone was throwing out ideas. All these space physicists, they also have these side bands and okay. some of them produce music. And so when cool. I was talking about reverb and you know this expansive sound is representing a mass ejection they were just like right on the same page they're like I love this idea um, and then like you mentioned you know a lot of these iterations that I've put out are more musical in nature mm -hmm. um, so that's what's known as parameter mapping sonification so I can take uh, data that's uh, recorded from something like the advanced composition Explorer satellite and then we can use that to control the parameters for sound synthesis
It's like if we had one of these oscillators here, um, and then we actually took the fundamental frequency and then tied that to the velocity of the solar wind, so the speed at which particles are going sure. by, then you wouldn't have pitch, to look. Yeah, you wouldn't have to look at a plot. You could just hear the pitch as it goes up and down. Crazy. Um, and then through iterative testing, I found that a better way to do that is to actually take noise, like you know, pink noise or white noise, to bandpass it, and then to modulate the cutoff filter mm. to the cutoff frequency. So when the speed goes up, you get, whoosh, and yep. the speed goes down, you get. Whoosh. There's another uh, mapping that I made where I took eight data parameters and I mapped it to 16 instruments in uh, symphony. And so in that instance, when a big wow. explosion took place, then you had these bells going doo -doo 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 -doo. So it's like this highly energetic phenomenon, and so we have this really highly energetic And you're letting sounds. the data drive? Letting those, the data drive all of it. You're not like writing music to the data, you're letting the data actually control yeah, the instruments so in a way? Yeah, so I'm creating the structure and then the data unfolds through that structure. And then in other instances, I'll allow the data to also dictate part of the structure. I'm like, when you're composing, you know, you get into the flow state where, you know, you really could just lose hours mm -hmm. and you're just plugging and things, you're just hearing things emerge and everything's just making sense and you just get lost in it. Um, so when I'm sonifying, I also want to hit that kind of flow state. Um, and I get to that place both when I'm learning about the data, so when I'm learning about like how do the, the speed and the temperature of the velocity, how do they interrelate, and then also when I'm setting up the structure so that I know that when I plug the data in, I have complete uh, knowledge and sort of understanding about how it's unfolding within my interface. And then also give myself a sort of sonic palette to work with. So kind of you know give myself a preset uh, sort of group of sounds like that a I think that or, yeah, yeah. And then those are always informed by the interrelations between the data. Crazy. So. And you're doing all that programming in Max MSP as far as the, the translation from the data mm -hmm. to man, it's so cool. Mm -hmm. Actually, train some of the scientists to do this on their own, right? Like, yeah. Uh, and so one of the really cool things was I did a study where I took 20 researchers and sat them down had them just look at the data set, and then had them look and listen. And they were, they found about 70% more events when you added sound. And you know, it's like interesting hearing the actual hum that you're picking up from the sun, the rotation of the sun that was underlying in that video. That is the sound that we've been hearing in movies for like 30 years of like spaceships, just mm -hmm. the mass of spaceships, just that low rumble. So the data set that I actually used for that um, was the solar wind velocity from the Advanced Composition Explorer, which was measuring the solar wind speed for 14 years. Um, wow. So we have that data sitting there and it's sampled at one data sample every two hours. So when you play it back, it 44,100 data samples per second that compresses the 14 yes. years down yes. into just a few seconds. So I looped it and I filtered out all those really transient explosive events and then what you get is just that A lot of people, when they listen to data sonification, they, they rightfully ask, you know, is this really scientifically accurate? Um, and it's the question that you should be asking, and, um, you know, by the very basis of what sonification is, the answer is yes. That's a lot of my research now is bringing the science to the public and bringing it to researchers and showing them, like, yes, we really can discover new things by using our ears. There's different filter types. Of Three, one of the tracks, you should just have him come in with data and we'll turn it into. Dude, I mean, re like seriously, yeah. if you, uh, I'm this, you, I'm this close. So if you wanted to do something, we could totally plan something like that. No obligation. All right, it happened right here. It's on. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed hanging out with Robert Alexander as much as I did. And I've learned so much, my mind is so exploded, and I'm gonna be <laughs> thinking about this for weeks to come. I can't wait to actually get together and actually try making something musical with your data and oh, joining our worlds. What do you wanna add? Anything else you wanna tell the people about 
Yeah, it's been such a pleasure uh, to come out here and you know, the line between you know science and art and music it's really just kind of imaginary um, and you know there are people who are you know really uh, you know pushing aesthetics and pushing art and technology and to be able to come out here to the studio and to see the wizardry that happens with all these patching cables you know that's it's uh, really been uh, my pleasure awesome. to see what's happening here really well amazing. I believe there is a next level to both of our worlds by joining them so hopefully we will find time in our near futures to collaborate on something and take data and try to sonify it in this room and make something else cool that we were both like, wow, we didn't even know this could, could happen. So until next time, this is Clayton signing off. Right. Robert Alexander, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming by. Peace.